make you mad. Yes. Yeah. Oh, cool. How about, has anyone ever hurt you? What about, have they ever done anything to you that you thought was wrong?
like those volcanoes that you have to do sometimes for science experiments. So not forgiving others also is hurtful to our bodies too. So we need to remember that we need to forgive others when they hurt us or when they make us mad so that we can make our bodies feel better and we can make our other bodies, our, our friends' bodies feel better, right? And most importantly, we want to forgive because who really wants us to forgive? <coughs> who tells us in the Bible that we should forgive others? God does, that's right. Yeah. So should we say a little prayer to help us remember to forgive others? All right, let's close our eyes and fold our hands. Dear Jesus, please help us to remember to forgive others when they do something wrong to us or they hurt us and so that we can help to let them go and also to get rid of the, the, the hurt in our bodies so that it doesn't build up and so that we don't explode from all of that anger. So we want to help us to remember to forgive and to grow and learn and be more like you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. 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 All right. <coughs> Let's take our Bibles and turn to, whoops, I got the wrong spot, and I just moved it. Turn to Matthew, chapter 28. Matthew, chapter 28, 19 and 20. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Go therefore and make, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. Amen. It was interesting, I'm sure several of you saw me texting while I was sitting up here. Got a little text from Lenny. And she said, Happy Sabbath, everybody. And I hadn't told her that I was going to announce this, that uh, I had gotten a text this week, but it was just there. So anyway, Happy Sabbath from Lenny Webby. Not yet. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, I wanted to note a few things. Brian, can you turn on the, the ceiling light? There's so many things that he has to do back there. <laughs> I don't know how he keeps it all straight. Um, but I'm going, I do want to mention that I'm very glad that he's there every single week helping us. So I think it's worth noting. Um, I also noted that the Sabbath school up here was very uh, was interesting because it actually ties in a lot to the sermon I wanted to give and I will be giving. Um, I also want to thank Amanda for taking up the uh, the children's story for me because uh, past 24 hours haven't been all that fantastic and I'll get into that a little bit as well because I found it interesting that every time I've tried to preach Satan has come after me in one way shape or form. Um, he let me get away with the first one, but made me feel bad for it afterwards. Uh, the last time we got 18 inches of snow and the plow truck broke in the, in the parking lot. Um, that one I still recorded anyway and still tried to get it out there for everybody. Um, this week has been fun. I think I clocked in over 60 hours. So um, it's, been, uh, it's been a fun uh, fun run but uh, it's been it was it was rough and I couldn't even come up with a children's story so I'm grateful for the assistance I get from all the various places because uh, I can tell you I've gotten a lot of uh, support and feedback from all of you about the messages I give and this one's been it's been on my heart for quite some time to give another message um, and the Lord put this one on my heart a couple months ago. So uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, I th thank you so much for this warm and wonderful 
church that we have. I'm so grateful that we have, <laughs> we're filling the church and it's, we're actually, we're running out of room and that's a fantastic problem to have. Uh, and I'm so grateful that you filled this church with people who are on fire for you, but also care so deeply about everybody here. And I'm just thankful to be part of this church family and your heavenly family, Lord. And I pray that this message that you've put on my heart will help spread more of that, that love out to those who need to hear it. So we pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So I wanted to start with a warning uh, that I wouldn't listen to just part of the sermon. Because uh, where it starts off from is not where you need to end. Um, and I actually struggled a little bit thinking of whether or not this message was the right one to give because it kind of comes out as a, a net zero. You don't really, not much is really going to change. But after doing more research on it and praying about it fervently, um, the thing that I am encouraging to change or I was encouraged to present uh, makes a world of difference. So, and I also, it also dovetails into Don's offering call about a cheerful giver. Um, and I think that you'll see that as it comes up. So we know that the Matthew 28, 19 through 20 is the Great Commission. Um, it's actually before I start going into that, I also got a lot of inspiration out of this from an Adventist learning community website called IBelieveBible.com. I had a, a very great write up, and several parts of this message are, are pulled from there, and some were from uh, my own personal insights into this. So we know that this is the Great Commission. We are to go and make disciples. So the big thing is go. You need to, act. there's an action. It's a call to actually do something. Now, where are you going? What are you going to do? When are you going? Those are important questions. Um, we recently got a message of, is this a life or death decision that you're making? And I've heard some people say that that life or death decision, you are making, if you choose not to go, you are making a life or death decision for somebody else. Um, that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. So is it a life or death decision? I think it is, but the question then remains whose? Um, so the million dollar question in front of me is, can my actions save anybody? Go, go for the answer. <laughs> There's, so in my opinion, no. And I'm glad that that pressure's not on me um, because I'm gonna fail. There's no, ways, there's no two ways about that. I'm not gonna go, I struggle with that at times. But if, that, if their salvation is on my shoulders, that's, that opens up a very big problem. Um, it's a scary thought, salvation, but in the end, at the end, salvation is obtainable only through Christ. Now, there's, and this is a fu that's a fundamental belief, that much we know. Um, even if I do perform an action that leads somebody to salvation, that wasn't me. That was Christ. Um, and there's, there's no two ways about that. Now, I can be involved in it, or I might not be involved in it. But at the end of the day, that can't determine somebody's salvation because my, whether I'm saved or not, will not impact whether my children are saved or my, or my wife. Everybody's salvation is their own relationship. And that's a key. So the alternative, if I didn't listen to God, I didn't go. If I couldn't convince somebody, if I just didn't have the right argument, if I didn't prepare well enough, if I fail, what happens? Will that person be lost to damnation for eternity because of my failure? If so, then their salvation rests on me. And we know that that just, that can't be. So it's, excuse me. If Christ truly died for their salvation, then my action or inaction doesn't 
play a part in that, and it can't. And this is where the warning comes from, because naturally, this moves into odd territory for some Christians. Am I saying it's pointless to evangelize? Am I, you know, why bother? If what we're doing has no bearing on their salvation, that's typically what people hear presented when that message starts. And this is why I started off with the warning, don't listen, don't stop here. There's more to this. So, we know that Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20 was quite clear. We were told, go, make disciples. So, am I calling Jesus a liar? No. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Beloved, let's love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So, for the, for the concept of salvation, it has to go through Christ. But what this is telling us is, if you know love, you know Christ. That God is love, Christ is God, it all equals out. So we know that there is a way to know Christ without ever having heard the gospel. That, now, part of the problem with this is we know that you have, there are, there's another verse that I won't read, that in order to be saved, you, it's through Christ alone. Only through Christ can you gain access to the Father. Now, the problem, is there are, there's several trains of thought um, on this that I found, and one was called, uh, exclusivism and the other is inclusivism and exclusivism says if you didn't have the gospel in your hands you are lost um, the problem I have with that is we know even today there are people alive on this planet right now never heard the gospel and the thought that those people are lost because somebody couldn't get out there with a Bible is a disappointing one there were even more people who hadn't had the chance to receive the gospel before this day. And if the name of Jesus is the only way, then there were people who were born before Jesus came on this earth who couldn't be saved if that's the case. Um, then, of course, there's also the, the people who couldn't make a conscious decision and what happens with them. So this, the, it seemed like such a simple question when I started, but you can see how it kind of whirlwind into a much bigger topic than I really thought it was going to be. So there are two stories I'd like to, to bring up, and I'm going to go through them. I might summarize a little bit. Uh, the first one is of a gentleman by the name of John Allen Chow. This was back in November of 2018. Um, he had, he was an evangelistic ministry, a um, missionary, um, who had heard of a island off of Indian, uh, a remote Indian island, and I've forgotten the name, but he had heard about them and, um, when he was only 17, and he did his first missionary trip. And the more I read, the more I was impressed that for nine years, he learned how to perform wilderness medicine, he learned how to try to adapt to less than cultured environments, so no running water, no hot water. He was trying, he was doing everything he could to prepare himself to go reach the people of that remote island. Um, and the reason why he did that was because he knew that no one had ever set foot on that island. They actively resisted outsiders. They were an indigenous people who would not tolerate anybody else on their island. But from the age of 17, he recognized that this was his calling. He felt compelled. And it wasn't just an overnight decision. He trained for years to reach these people. So, excuse me. Uh, and my apologies, I have lost my place, which was bound to happen. So, in his, he left behind his diary. Um, with 
the fishermen that he illegally paid to get him close enough to the island because it was forbidden for any external people to go there because they knew what would happen. Um, he wrote in his diary that, I don't want to die. Would it be wiser to leave and let somebody else continue? No, I don't think so. I could still make it back to the U.S. somehow as it almost seems like certain death to stay here. Ugh, I really should have done better on my notes. Sorry. There was another part to that. He also wrote, this is not a pointless thing. Oh, we'll go back. Please do not be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Rather, please live your lives in obedience to whatever he has called you to, and I'll see you again when you pass through the veil. This is not a pointless thing. The eternal lives of this tribe is at hand, and I can't wait to see them around the throne of God, worshiping them, him in their own language, just as Revelation 7 verses 9 through 10 state. So, the... If... What I'm presenting is true. He didn't need to do that. Um, not quite the message that I'm aiming for. If you look at what he wrote, it showed how much love he had for everybody on that island whom he had never met. He wanted them to understand the love that God had for them because they hadn't had a chance to hear the gospel message. And there was something special about the gospel message that he wanted to make sure they heard. There was another story that I wanted to share, and it was actually sung about by Stephen Curtis Chapman. Um, and it's from a book called Through the Gates of Splendor. Um, and it deals with five missionaries who went to Ecuador in the 50s, and there were a tribe and I'm not going to butcher their name down in Ecuador, that they tried to reach to, um, all five missionaries were killed in the process. They became martyrs. Now, when his son and wife heard about this, they went forward as well, and they tried to reach out to those people. And it was amazing because, while they may have take, taken the lives of those five missionaries, the fact that though the wife and son of somebody who they, they had killed came to them still to reach with them to that uh, reach, bring this message to them, converted the entire tribe. They all witnessed something that makes no sense on anything earthly. Um, it goes well above and beyond. And I mean, that story was significant because the love that God put into the original missionaries' hearts was also shared with the family around them. Um, and I was reading up a little bit more this morning about uh, John Allen Cho, who he was well regarded because everybody, he, had, he was filled with such a passion and a drive for reaching people for God's sake that it inspired a number of people around him. He was remembered very, very well as, as for his dedication. And, you know, it's... <coughs> It's impressive that it's, I'm grateful for the fact that so many people are capable of, are listening for God's voice in this. Um, and there's, excuse me again, my apologies. So, I want to bring up two additional points. The first is found in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Romans 1, verses 18 through 20. Gotta love how it just turns. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made, so that they are without excuse. There's another version, and I don't remember which one I copied this from, so it, that says, so men are without excuse. So whether presented from the gospel that we have, or presented through nature and God's... Um, 
personal instruction through dreams, through visions, through um, other uh, other ways that God can reach them. Because I wouldn't even fathom trying to limit what He can do. There is a way for us to know and understand God without necessarily having the gospel. Don't get me wrong on that. The the gospel is absolutely a luxury for us. We have very clearly written what he means. Though, I I suppose some might argue about the clarity, since we have so many arguments about that. Um, The second reading that I wanted to go to was, comes from Ellen White, and it's an excerpt from The Desire of Ages. Among the heathen among the heathen are those who worship God ignorantly, those to whom the light is never brought by human instrumentality, yet they will not perish. Though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature, and have done the things that the law is that the law required. Their works are evidence that the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts, and they recog- they are recognized as the children of God. So the verse from Romans talks a bit about God's wrath, and there's there's an importance to that, but that's not the focus I have at the moment. The focus I have is on how God is able to reveal his qualities to mankind without us being, exactly, without using us as necessarily. So each one of us can count ourselves blessed for having the Bible to help guide us, but God's will and glory can be made to know be made known to those who don't have that luxury. And it absolutely is a luxury. And even Ellen White and a lot of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church knew that. So, back to my early question. If the Great Command contained a life or death clause, whose life is on the line? And I would throw out there that, in kind of a twist of fate, it's actually our own. Matthew 28, 19-20, the Great Commission, was absolutely clear. We are to go. But the command was given to us. We are meant to try and be the hands and feet of God through where he leads us to. We need to show and share the love of God to those around, around us. We are his people. So the command is our command. But it's so ignoring it won't risk them because God will reach them no matter what. But it can be on us. So I want to read James chapter 4, verse 17. James chapter 4, verse 17. So for one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, for him it is sin. Now, the right thing can be put on our minds from a messenger from God, a prophet. It can become from the Holy Spirit within us. It can come from dreams. But it's clear that we need, if we know that this is right, this was the Great Commission, it was clear to us that we are to go then not doing it is sin. It's very clear. And Jesus said that he would be with us if we go. And as we've been bringing out as often as we can lately, sin is basically anything done without God. If God's not with you, you're trying to do it on your own. That's not a good idea. Those missionary stories that we brought up show that these people had a fervent love for God. And they felt called. Now, we can't know. We can obviously see from um, the Ecuadorian example that we could see that they were reached. For Mr. Chow, we don't know what happened with that. It could be anything. Um, And I wouldn't even hazard a guess as to what that actually means. What I do know is that that man had a love for God that was not going to be quenched even by fear. Um, and But even he wrote in his diary at one point that, you know, God, wouldn't it be better for me to live and bring the word somewhere else versus dying here? But he trained for nine days or nine years to get to that point. And much like Christ, if this isn't your will, please take, or please take the cup from me. But if it's your will, then your will be done. He knew what the risks were. And it he, but he knew exactly what he was going there for, regardless of the risks. I guess I should say. 
So back to the warning from the beginning. Why should we do what Jesus said? Because someone else may not have eternal life? I don't think that that's correct. So then how about our own eternal salvation as well? It's actually not what I'm aiming for. Um, so what am I playing at? And this is where Don's reading comes in. So I believe the answer for that is actually found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse six, verses 6 and 7. Now I say this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows generously will also reap generously. Each one must do just as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The keys on that is not reluctantly or under compulsion. If it's for salvation, then really, then that's a threat. That's not willing, that's not... That's not of a ch that you're not going to be cheerful from that. But either way you want to look at it, how can you be a cheerful giver anyway? <clears throat> One would say, and I've had this discussion with Steve, we have to make the choice, but God even gives us the desire to make the choice. Then God <coughs> pr provides us everything after that point. So you want to be a cheerful giver? God will show you how to be a cheerful giver. He will help you see things how he sees things. That's how you get to be a cheerful giver. But that's the purpose for the Great Commission, just as much as it is about tithing, just about as much as it is everything else that God's asked us, to, asked us to do. He does not want us to do it out of obligation. He wants us to do it because he wants to show us what that love is really like. He wants to give us that experience. And that's the key to that. This is why, at the end of the day, I thought, you know, this message may not be, at the end, we still are going to go. We still should go. That's what we were called to do. But the why behind we go is important. God didn't, uh, I can't remember the verse, but God was not thrilled with the sacrifices be that people were giving because it meant nothing to them. They didn't understand the purpose behind it. It was not... It, it didn't. It didn't impact them. It didn't phase them. It wasn't. Show, they weren't getting anything out of it. He'd much rather us be cheerful in what we're doing, but to do so requires us to want to see things the way he does. So, why should we go out and go into the world to make disciples? Because we need to love the. We love those people, and you know, I'm preaching to the choir here. That everybody in this church, we get this. I know. And that's why I love this church. Um, but it's not because there's a risk at, at, involved in it. It's because we want to do it. Because Christ put that in our hearts. So, like I said earlier, that th this topic dives into a concept of inclusivism and exclusivism. It, was, it actually took me quite a while while even be able to say those words correctly. Um, I remember I messed those up pretty bad when I was talking to Steve a couple days ago, and I thought I'd better practice that a couple times before I had to come up here. So this, there, if you were ever to have this type of a discussion with some other Christians, they, from what I found on some sites, people can get very, uh, very polarized about this one. Um, you're either one way or the other, you're either inclusivistic, exclusivistic. Some people actually went to universalistic, which is basically everybody saved, which I won't even dive into. Uh, not this time, anyway. So my intent is to actually cover some of this in, a, in another sermon. Um, this section I actually really wanted to read, and it actually comes from the uh, Adventist Learning um, website that I talked about earlier. And I felt that this was a, a very solid way to, to end this. Um, and I say ending loosely because there's still some Bible texts we're going to go over. But while this concept is never fully spelled out in the Bible, except for debatably in Romans 2, there are some hints at it. The first one is found in 1 Kings <coughs> chapter 17, and it doesn't actually give the verses, but 
for in says First Kings seventeen, for example, the widow of Zarephath is a non-Israelite who has received communication and instructions from Israel's God, even though she is not part of the covenant community. And interestingly, she receives this interaction from God before being visited by one of his prophets. In 1 Kings 10, verses 1 through 13, which we don't have to turn to, we also see the Queen of Sheba coming from Ethiopia to visit Solomon in Jerusalem. From the small handful of things she says, she demonstrates an interesting amount of familiarity with God's with Israel's God. Overall, this is a difficult topic. We should respect those who are seeking the answer, but come to a different conclusion than us. God is free to save people even if we don't fully understand how he does it. That was a, a beautiful sentence that they had. It, it, I love it. Jesus died for all people, so he is able to save all people and forgive sins. But since we cannot predict or know who God will save in ways that are far beyond our understanding, it remains our duty to do just what Jesus said and go spread the message of his kingdom to the world, to everyone. Let us bow our heads for the benediction. Lord, we thank you so much for the wonderful power of the blood of the Lamb. We thank you so much that Jesus came for our salvation and that you call us to be part of the spreading of your word, your love, so that we can witness even more the, the magnitude of your love for all of us here. We thank you so much, and we ask that you please be with us as we go out into this week as your hands and feet to try to show the world what your love truly means. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.